Hello, welcome to Revision Tips for SIPS Level 3. This is the Advanced Certificate in Procurement and Supply Operations. And we're looking at Socially Responsible Procurement, Module 5, Learning Outcome 4. And that's to understand the methods to, com to monitor corporate social responsibility in procurement. So we're going to look at things like KPIs, audits, supplier appraisals and the use of regulatory frameworks. So KPIs, that stands for Key Performance Indicators. They identify specific areas that an organisation can focus on, such as the proportion of waste that's recycled, <clears throat> the total electricity consumption per staff member, or the new employment opportunities created in the local community. So your key KPIs should be included as part of your CSR policy, and it's used to measure the company's social, environmental and economic performance. Provides a quantifiable measure of the organisation's CSR performance according to a specified standard, quantity or schedule that can be built up over time. So the steps in the KPI process firstly is to identify the activities that will produce the social, economic and environmental effects that are of most concern. The second stage is to create by gathering data in a format that allows comparison to other businesses over time. Combine the data so that it can be representing the entire business. Third step is to evaluate. Are the goals of the companies being met against the KPIs? The fourth is to change. What process improvements are required in order to meet the KPIs? And then finally to assess, are the KPIs still appropriate? or do goals need to be adjusted or the KPIs changed to reflect changing priorities? We're now going to look at some examples of KPIs for waste and social. So on the environmental KPIs, these are KPIs governing waste centre on landfill and recycling. So the first one is the percentage of waste recycled. This is calculated by taking the amount of waste recycled or reused and dividing it by the total waste produced and timesing it by 100. This could be measured in number of bags or in tonnes. You can then measure the percentage of total waste that's sent to landfill. Many organisations have a target of 0% to be sent to landfill by 2020 or 2030. Effectively, this means reusing or recycling all of your waste. The automotive industry and manufacturers such as Ford, Subaru and Toyota are achieving this. And then finally, percentage of waste generated from manufacturing and distribution. The waste reduction rate measures waste raw materials between two periods to see if there's been an improvement over time or not. The social KPIs look at employee engagement. Some of the United Nations Conference or trade development, on Trade Development Indicators show how you can measure employment practices. So from a workplace point of view, you can look at gender of employees, the employment type, whether they're full-time or part-time, and their contract, is it permanent or temporary? You can then look at wage rates and benefits of those full-time or part-time employees and the gender of those employees. Percentage of employees in a union or covered by collective agreement, the training skills and development and the average number of hours of training per employee, per year, per category, that will total the number of training hours per year. And then the last one at the bottom, the employee turnover rate, the ETR. This is calculated by looking at the total number of employees that have left your company in a year and dividing it by the average number of employees in that same year, timesing it by 100 to calculate a percentage. So let's now look at audits and in specifically our CSR audits. Organisations conduct CSR audits of their suppliers to ensure that its supply chain is continuing to meet the organisation's CSR standard. They provide an organisation with an immediate insight into its supply chain, enabling it to evaluate a supplier's social and environmental compliance with the organisation's policies 
and specified procedures. The auditor looks at the systems, processes and procedures across an organisation's supply chain. And where non-compliance or poor performance is identified, the organisation can address this immediately and review its supplier appraisal process. Can be conducted as part of the audit team from within an organisation or contracted to a third party. An internal audit report is called a self-declaration. And the third party audits are used when organisations want an independent overview of their ethical manufacturing programme or to ensure that their systems conform to a standard set such as ISO 2400. Auditors can review employees to, or sorry, they can interview their employees to know how per per pervasive environmental awareness is throughout the company. So these environmental audits is an essential way of confirming and verifying that stated environmental initiatives meet the standards set and that an environmental management system is properly operated. And social audits measure the supply chain's compliance to social aspects with the company's ethical code of conduct or international standard and regulations. Now supplier appraisals are carried out prior to awarding a contract, but audits are an evaluation of a supplier during its delivery phase. But these appraisals assess how suitable or capable a supplier is to ensure they can supply the specified goods and services. And by checking that they have the appropriate environmental and social policies and procedures in place prior to being awarded a contract. Examples will include policies relating to air quality, noise, waste, water and packaging. The most effective way of obtaining this information is by issuing a questionnaire that covers each area in turn. The supplier first needs to be provided with a specification so they're aware of the requirements and the purchaser must have benchmarking against each criteria when their tenders or proposals can be evaluated. And the benefits of conducting a supplier appraisal includes being able to identify suppliers whose policies and activities align to yours, eliminating from further opportunities and future opportunities of any supplier not conforming. So you're able to detect possible weaknesses in supplier performance at an early stage. And it also informs potential suppliers of what's expected of them in the areas of environmental and social sustainability. We're now going to look at some regulatory frameworks and what you can see on the screen is the water stewardship framework. But there's actually no global environmental or social law or regulations that control international supply chains. Countries have their own legislation that address social and environmental practices. So there's wide variation in the application of best practice. There are global conventions such as the International Labour Organization, ILO, and the Kyoto Protocol, but these are voluntary. The majority of efforts to manage supply chain issues have come from in the form of voluntary initiatives or industry schemes. Examples of industry legislation come from the International Council of Mining and Minerals. Members consist of approximately 60 mining companies and associations and they set out members' approach to water stewardship in this framework. But your regulatory framework is just a model that policymakers and others can use to reform and apply regulations in an effective and logical way. Regulatory frameworks exist to bridge the gap in global regulations. Some other bits to consider is um, an environmental impact assessment and the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So in the environmental impact assessment, this considers the environmental impact that a project or organisation will have. And these environmental impact assessments differ between countries, which can make it really hard to accommodate components between each country. But the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is an international document that outlines the basic rights and freedoms that all human beings are entitled to. 
It's adopted by the United Nations Assembly in 1948. And it's accepted in principle by nearly every nation in the world, although it has been adapted to apply to different parts of the world. But it's been a catalyst for an expanding system of human rights protections for groups such as disabled people, indigenous people and women. So here are just some examples of regulatory frameworks for the environment. So you've got um, water and pollution, the mining and watership steward, water stewardship, and air quality and greenhouse gas emissions. In terms of the social regulatory frameworks, these are other things that you can look up, such as the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights, the Millennium Development Goals of 2000, the UN Global Compact, the guiding principles or the RUGI framework. Other regulatory frameworks around the world, the Modern Slavery Act in the UK, the Mine Health and Safety Act in South Africa, the Californian Transparency Act in supply chains, and the Corporate Duty of Vigilance Act in France. And this is an Australian laws of governing human rights standards. Does your country have laws that are similar to this area? And what are they? The Australian laws governing human rights standards covers for things like protection against discrimination, equal opportunities, working conditions such as wages, health and safety, property rights and other social and cultural rights, imposing liability for human rights abuses, and that's basically an international covenant on civil and protection rights. Thank you for watching.